What's good, y'all? It's your boy Ross back at again with another video. So we're gonna check out 11 precise moments wrestling fans turned on baby faces, man. It is it's crazy how things play out in wrestling. There'll be a moment where the baby faces are supposed to get cheered, they're supposed to, you know, you know, the fans are supposed to be behind this person. And it, it'll just be either they were over pushed or it was just a situation that didn't make sense to the point where it kind of just ruined that person's character. And then people were just like, you know what? We can't root for this person anymore. We we can't we can't cheer for this person anymore. And uh, we've we've definitely seen that a, a few times, especially in WWE, where someone would just get booked or they just get shoved down our throats with the booking to the point where it's like, you know what? We don't like this character. We're going to boo them. No matter how many times you tell us we should cheer them, we're going to boo them because you clearly don't know what we want. <laughs> or sometimes us fans, we don't know what we want. So we're going to check this out. Appreciate all the love and support. Let's get right into this thing. You know, they say that baby faces are harder to book than heels. You know, they say that baby faces are harder to book than heels. While it is much easier in decades past when wrestling fans were just happy to cheer the goodies and boo the baddies, the late 90s saw a shift and cool heels took over the business. And with the rise of social media post-2011 and to an extent forum posting in the mid-2000s, shout out to the Smart Marks forum, which was my home ground for bitching about wrestling in 2005, fans are now more than happy to just let whatever company know that we think their baby face creative is utter shite. And in some of those cases, it ruined babyface runs. I'm Luke Owen, hailing from Parts Fun Known, and these are 11 precise moments that wrestling fans turned on babyfaces. Number 11, Roman Reigns, WWE Royal Rumble 2015. Yeah. It's pretty hard to believe nowadays, in an era when he can get away with his San Martino-esque championship run and an entrance that lasts longer than most Prime Minister's careers, but people really didn't like Roman Reigns for a while. Very Much true. of the animosity towards Reigns can be chalked up to his superhero level booking and a fundamental misunderstanding understanding of what makes a person likable. The 2015 Royal Rumble is where things really started to turn south for the big tribal dog chief. He was popular in 2014. He won the Slammy for Superstar of the Year on a fan vote. We all mm -hmm. wanted him to win the 2014 Rumble. But yeah. oh, what a difference a year makes. Shortly after his legendary championship victory at the previous year's WrestleMania, Daniel Bryan was forced to vacate the title due to injury. After eight months of speculation as to whether or not he would return to the ring, Bryan announced in January 2015 that he was cleared to return turn just in time for the rum once that was announced it was over people only wanted one thing and that was for daniel bryan to win i'm, I'm just be honest with you only because his title reign was cut short because of injury people wanted to see that that's it that's literally what it was it was nothing else other than when daniel bryan comes back we want him back in the title scene opportunity because we didn't get that run that we always really wanted we got the journey to the run, but we didn't get the title run we always wanted. And there was, it, Roman wasn't going to be the guy. It, it, nobody else was going to be the guy other than Daniel Bryan at that moment. Learning from their mistake the previous year, more on that later, WWE put Bryan in the match only to have him eliminated early. The crowd immediately turned on the remaining participants yeah. and directed most of their ire towards eventual winner Roman Reigns. Didn't Not even matter. a run-in from The Rock, who raised Reigns' arm in victory, could save this crowd, who continued booing as a confused Rock presumably wondered how and why his cousin had managed to fumble the family legacy so badly. Number 10, Liv Morgan, WWE SummerSlam 2020. 22. Yep. Wrestling fans are a fickle bunch. Mm -hmm. Please let our favorites win, Papa. They say, begging bowls in hand, we'll mm -hmm. be ever so appreciative and never ask for anything again. Okay, the promotion replies, but you'd better not immediately turn on them the second they win gold and go right back to complaining all the time. Perish their thought. They say, grubby little fingers mm -hmm. crossed behind their treacherous little backs. Wouldn't even dream of it, governor. So after years of asking for Liv Morgan to be given a chance with the gold, WWE pulled the trigger at Money in the Bank 2022 when Morgan won the show's titular ladder match before cashing in a briefcase on SmackDown Women's Champion Ronda Rousey to begin her first reign with the big one. A series of uninspiring matches and some so-so character work saw fans begin to grow restless of Liv Morgan almost immediately. Until yeah. later that month at SummerSlam, she faced Ronda Rousey in a rematch for the title. Rousey dominated for the majority of the match before Morgan scored a 
lucky pin by rolling Rousey onto her back during an armbar. Worse than that, they did the old tap out spot while yeah. getting the pin finished, meaning in everyone's eyes except the referees, Liv had just lost. Yeah. It was a bit of catch 22 booking from Triple. Yeah, it was one of those things where it's like she kind of technically lost. She won, but she lost. So not only did it not help her momentum, if you're watching this as a fan, it was like, well, she really didn't win that. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, are we supposed to cheer for her still? As he struggled to deal with the narrative remnants of the Vince era by trying to keep Rousey strong while not immediately cutting Morgan's first run short. But the crowd was already long gone, enthusiastically yep. booing Morgan during an Oh shucks, I tried my best promo on the following week's SmackDown. Number nine, Sammy Guevara and Tay Mello. And here's the thing about that whole situation. There were a lot of people wanting Liv Morgan to be the champ. All right, cool, whatever. I think her winning the money in the bank, I don't have a problem with. The cash in so soon, that's where it was a recipe for a disaster. I think they should have built up to it. I think they should have teased it more. Have people really get that fever pitch. Like, we can't wait for Liv Morgan to cash in. Wait for the opportune moment and then cash in. Because ultimately, they put the belt on her as soon as she got the, the, the briefcase. That same night. And it was like, it was a cool moment. But I think it would have been better earned if people have to wait for it just a little bit more. And then you go and pull the trigger. Now, granted, I don't know how the booking would have went after that. Who knows? But I think waiting could have possibly helped just a little bit, in my opinion. AEW Dynamite, March 23rd, 2022. You'd think wrestling promoters would have learned by now. Wrestling fans are not interested in romance. Well, unless you go by WWE's YouTube numbers, but those people yeah. are weird. We don't need love. We have stats and memorabilia and trivia about One Night Stand 2005. Did you know that JBL shot punch the blue meanie for real Z's? <laughs> fans were already predisposed to not react well to Sammy Guevara and Tay Conte's relationship as it came not long after Guevara very publicly proposed to his previous girlfriend at an AEW Dynamite taping just a few mm -hmm. months earlier. Honestly, that's nobody's business but theirs, but you try telling wrestling fans to stay out of wrestlers' personal lives. Yeah. Sammy and Tay came out on the March 23rd edition of AEW Dynamite to deliver a promo about Guevara's recent loss of the TNT title to Scorpio Sky. This promoted Sky's manager Dan Lambert to come out and brag about the win, kissing the belt as he did. And as he kissed it, Guevara and Conti revealed that they had slept together while wearing that belt, a fact Conti later backed up with photographic evidence on Twitter. It oh. was an obnoxious bit of promo work from two people that were already on thin ice to begin with and started Tay and Sammy on the path to fully fledged heeldom. Number 8, Which Tetsuya works Naito for? Power Struggle 2013. Which works in 2013, right Tetsuya Naito was being pushed as New Japan's next big thing. He just won the G1 Climax and was on his way to main eventing Wrestle Kingdom, New Japan's biggest show of the year, against Kazuchika Kurokada, one of its biggest stars. However, fan reaction to Naito was underwhelming to say the least, and there were worries that putting him in the top spot of the flagship event would undermine the show. At that year's Power Struggle pay view in which Naito defended his never openweight championship and Wrestle Kingdom contract against Masato Tanaka, the crowd were completely heatless for what should have been a major bout. But when Naito emerged after the main event to stand face to face with Okada, you could legitimately hear a pin drop in the room. And that is not hyperbolic. It was deadly silent. The total yeah. lack of interest and clear push against Naito caused New Japan to worry and rethink the direction of Naito's character. Damn. This led to New Japan holding a fan vote for whether it would go ahead with the planned main event of Naito vs. Takada or switch it with the planned semi-main event of Shinsuke Nakamura vs. Hiroshi Tanahashi. When the results were announced, Naito and Akada had gotten only half of the votes Nakamura and Tanahashi had gotten, thus losing their main event spot. Damn. Sticks and stones can break my bones, but silence can kill a push dead. Number Damn. 7. Damn, Ronda crazy. Rousey WWE Survivor Series 2018 This is our first example of fans turning on a wrestler due to their support of another wrestler who wasn't even there that day. In 2018, Becky Lynch was on a hot streak, winning crowd support despite WWE's constant attempts to turn her heel. You yeah. all hate me, Becky would say in her promos, to rapturous praise from the crowd yeah. who clearly <laughs> loved her. You were never there for me, she'd argue, as everyone chanted her name. At that year's Survivor Series, Lynch was supposed to face Ronda Rousey in a 
champion versus champion match, but was accidentally given a legit concussion from Nia Jax just a few mm -hmm. days before. Charlotte Flair replaced Lynch, and to be fair, the two had a pretty fantastic little match. They However, did. it ended in disqualification as Flair hit Rousey with a kendo stick and proceeded to administer a brutal and very heelish post-match beatdown. Despite this, the fans cheered Flair on, presumably seeing Charlotte as somehow the instrument of Lynch's will, taking yeah. down the coronated top women's star to make place for the ascendancy of the man. Number six, The Rock. W Which was a crazy situation how Charlotte was getting cheered for beating the living crap out of Ronda Rousey. Because at that point, it was really just Becky Lynch is the person we want in this spot. Charlotte's just a surrogate for Becky Lynch at this point. Once again, it's crazy. Fans can be fickle, but we know who we want to see. And Becky Lynch was the person. She was she was the person that even though WWE wanted us to hate her, there was there was nothing they could do. We weren't gonna hate her. WrestleMania X8 and also SummerSlam 2002. A rare mm -hmm. instance of a match where the crowd turning on one of the performers actually elevated it. WrestleMania X8 saw Rock and Hogan, two icons, go toe-to-toe -to -toe in an intergenerational dream match that we never actually thought we might get to see. What WWE hadn't accounted on, though, was that this WWF crowd was super happy to see Hulk Hogan yeah. back in a WWF ring, which they didn't missing expect from since the early 90s. So no matter how many trucks he ran the Rock over with, this crowd cheered Hogan like the conquering babyface and booed The Rock mercilessly, prompting yeah. the company to turn Hogan immediately babyface the following night on they had to. And it wouldn't be the only time in 2002 that the crowd turned on the Dwayne one as SummerSlam 2002 saw them cheer heel Brock Lesnar as he dissembled The Rock like an errant deer carcass mm -hmm. in the show's main event. I'd say it was a bad year for The Rock, but 2002 was also the year of the Scorpion King, launching Johnson's Hollywood career and putting him on the path to becoming one of the most successful film stars of all time. You know yeah. what they say, a year in the professional life of Dwayne The Rock Johnson is like pizza. Even when it's bad, it's still pretty good. Number five, <laughs> Lita, WWE Raw, April 18th, 2005. Lita vs. Trish Stratus is one of the most iconic women's feuds in wrestling history and yep. is part of the real reason women's wrestling enjoys the level of prestige it does today. However, in 2005, the feud almost ended up being derailed thanks to pretty personal circumstances that wrestling fans decided was their business. Lita dated Matt Hardy for uh, six years yeah. between 99 and 2005. In February of that year, Matt Hardy and Lita. Been cheating on Hardy Edge. with Edge, Love a situation triangle. that would soon be worked into a wrestling angle and one of the worst booked wrestling returns of all time for Matt Hardy, but that's another list for another day. On the April 18th episode of Raw, Trish Stratus, the heel in the feud, came out to deliver a promo on the face Lita. Lita came out on crutches, but no amount of sympathetic props will stop a crowd of early 2000s wrestling fans from hurling sexist abuse. So yeah. that's exactly what they did. Trish tried her best to keep the segment on track by drawing back some of the heat on herself, but the fans would not forgive Lita. WWE, in one of their trademark classy moves, would bring the Edge Lita relationship to television just a few weeks later, turning Lita heel in the process. Number four, Cody Rhodes, AEW Revolution. I mean, there was nothing they could do. Once it got out, oh, there was nothing they could do. Bro. It, boy, and if we're talking about wrestling back then in the 2000s era, was way different <laughs> than what it is now. Hell, media was way different. You could say a lot more back then. Just now. Now, nah. fans let her have it, and it was like, you know what, we gotta roll with the punches here. 2021. Adrenaline in my soul. <laughs> Turns out no one likes Cody Rhodes. Believe it or not, people didn't turn on Cody because of how annoying that meme is when people get the syllable count wrong like I just did there. No, it's because he spent the final year of his AEW run being booked like the love child of Lex Luger and John Cena, and even then, they'd probably tell him to tone the America stuff down. In the lead-up to Revolution 2021, Rhodes had just come off the back of a weird gender-revealed segment and a self-indulgent celebrity feud with Shaquille O'Neal, so people were already starting to get a little tired of him. While while Rose yeah. didn't receive the level of backlash he would for later stunts like that promo where he sold racism, the face of the Revolution ladder match was when things started to turn south for the former Stardust. Rhodes did that spot where a wrestler gets hurt and then hobbles to the back before re-emerging to bravely soldier on, and the crowd were not having any of it. He took a Canadian destroyer on the ladder, and they still pelted Rhodes with boos like he just announced he was defecting to WWE. Number three, yep. Bailey, WWE Extreme Rules. It is crazy how during his later you know his end of his run in aew he he wasn't like fan wise they wanted him to turn heel that's really what it was they wanted it was the john cena effect they wanted him to turn heel he didn't want to turn heel he stayed true to his character he just didn't want to turn heel and then he ended up leaving and now 
People love him. <laughs> People love him and can't wait for him to come back in WWE. It's, it's crazy how things work, bro. 2017. Before she wanted to speak to everybody's manager, Bailey was one of wrestling's most earnest baby faces, entering each match to an AI generated Carly J. Repson song and dressing like Lisa Frank threw up on her, mm -hmm. and it was fing awesome. And everyone loved Bailey in NXT because she was the best i loved her so much while bailey's sincerity did get her over with nxt fans the main roster crowd did not Ooh. like the fact that she was a character that appealed to children and weird men like me in their 30s this came to a head at extreme rules 2017 when the hugger faced alexa bliss in a <sighs> kendo stick on a pole match during the match bailey got the better of bliss standing over her with a kendo stick ready to strike unfortunately bailey's instinct to be nice overrode her desire to do the main thing that yeah. wrestlers are supposed to do you know, win mm, matches, yeah. and she choked, <laughs> leaving Bliss an opening to recover and ultimately win. The booking made Bailey look weak and naive to the point that she wasn't even sympathetic anymore. No. And the fans sure let her know that. Number two, yeah, WWE Hell in a Cell 2019. I mean, you all knew this one was coming, right? People yeah. like to point out that Hell in a Cell 2019 was the moment the Fiend gimmick died, and that is fair enough, but people forget that there were two casualties in that main event's lock box of hard knocks, shocks, and bollocks. Seth Rollins' reputation didn't come out of the cell unscathed. It's not exactly Rollins' fault, but his role in the match seemed like it was to make it as boring as possible. First he hit a curb stomp, and then another, mm -hmm. then another, mm -hmm. and then another, then yep. another, and another, stomping and stomping, and the feed kicked out of every single pinfall at one for a total of, I sh you not, 11 That's curb stops. It doesn't matter how many good something is, if you have 11 of them in a row, you're going to get irritable. Apart from maybe Quality Street, because I've just eaten 11 of them while writing this script and I haven't thrown up yet. Rollins then used a chair, a ladder, a toolbox, a butcher, a baker, and a candlestick maker to first attack, then literally bury the fiend under the world's most spiteful construction project. Seth Rollins' assault was so monotonous that even eventually the referee got bored and called for a deep, <laughs> tarnishing the legacy of the cell as a huge ending mega gimmick. Rollins' booking had been awful in the build-up to the match yep. itself, but this was the icing on the sh cake. One of the most enduring images of the night is a dejected-looking Rollins walking to the back, knowing what just happened was an absolute disaster passed a sign that read seth rollins <laughs> is not, not cool <laughs> yeah man oh that match will live in infamy as one of the worst booked matches one of the worst booked hell in the sales one of the worst character assassination matches of all time it just it was just dumb it shouldn't have happened it shouldn't have happened no that match shouldn't have not happened like that it shouldn't have even, if you're not going to put the title on set on, on the Fiend at the time, it didn't matter. This is why they should have kept the Fiend away from the titles for a bit. Ah, yeah. You know, it, hey, at least they've came out better in the overall grand scheme of things. They're in a much better situation. Seth Rollins is doing some of the best work of his career. And Bray Wyatt, is, it seems like he's enjoying what he's doing and, you know, has the fans interested in what's going to happen coming, in, you, know, you know, leading into the future, so. And number one, joint number one, Batista and Rey Mysterio, WWE Royal Ooh. Rumble 2014. Ah, the 2014 Royal Rumble. An event so poorly booked, it made the crown turn on not one, not seven, but two fan favorites in the space of about 10 minutes. All yep. because they had the audacity to not be Daniel Bryan, when we wanted both of them to be Daniel Bryan. The crowd mm -hmm. also booed John Cena and Randy Orton earlier in the night because they also weren't Daniel Bryan. Mm -hmm. But remember, Road Dogg has told us this was the plan all along. It no, it wasn't, wasn't it Road Dogg, you can't. Honey, mother and no, it wasn't, and you know it wasn't. It and wasn't. if you're not down with that, I've got two words for you. You're full of shit, man. Fans were eager to see Brian in the Rumble, if not as its eventual winner, but at least as someone who put in a gutsy performance to help advance his reputation as the lovable underdog. However, mm -hmm. Rey Mysterio emerged as the 30th entrant, thus eliminating any chance of Brian participating in the match. And the mood in the arena turned sour as people Ooh. started booing, ironically, the lovable masked underdog Rey Mysterio. Which Things just wild. got worse from there as fans continued to boo the remaining participants. They did briefly pause to cheer Reigns over yeah. obvious winner Batista, but resumed jeering as the inevitable happened and Batista won the match, cementing his place in the main event of the show of shows. WWE were then forced to change their planned main event of Batista winning the title from former Evolution stablemate Randy Orton in the main event of WrestleMania 30 to Brian picking up the belt instead. Yep. Unless of course your road dog and tell us it was the plan all along, even though Batista and Brian have said that it wasn't, you're full of sh road no. dog. So that's our <laughs> list. I don't know why he says that 
It was never the fucking plan. If you believe that was the plan booking, you guys, no, bro. No, you got to be naive to believe that. That was not the plan booking. They did not. In fact, we know it wasn't the plan booking because CM Punk was supposed to be there. He no-showed. He was supposed to be there that night. I think CM Punk was supposed to face Triple H, if I'm not mistaken. No, he was supposed to face Triple H. It, Daniel Bryan wasn't even supposed to be in the main event. I'm just be honest with you. We all know he wasn't supposed to be in the main event, but things happened for a reason. It was his time. That's all I can say. It was his time to be the guy to win and overcome the odds. And it was a beautiful moment and made for one of, if not one of the greatest WrestleMania moments of all time, bro. Anytime I talk about it, I get goosebumps, man. Anytime I talk about it, I get goosebumps. But comment down below, let me know. What was the precise moment that you uh, started booing or not caring for a character even though they were a baby face? I want to know down below. Let me know. Just any wrestler at some point when you was like, you know what? I don't want to cheer them on. I'm going to boo them. Don't really care for their character as a baby face. Let's boo them. Let me know down below. But I appreciate all love and support. Road to 150K. Appreciate y'all kicking with me. See y'all in the next one. Peace.